Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's LJC event with Rory. Um, let me introduce myself first of all, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Abby. I work with the LJC and the other 15-ish communities, all of which are free for our members and run by RecWorks. RecWorks are a tech recruitment company, but with a big, big difference. Obviously, as a company, we're always on the lookout for more clients. And some of our best clients have actually come from community members who recommended RecWorks to their internal talent team. So if you're hiring for a new team or you're working for a company that is, we would love to hear from you. If you'd like to know more about what we can offer, then please do message me on LinkedIn or Slack. My name is as you see it on the screen, and we really look forward to having that conversation and working with you. So what's the difference, I hear you ask? Well, also, we really do believe that recruitment can be a force for good in the industry beyond just placing people in jobs. We have a particular focus on learning, mentoring and personal development. And that's where our communities and events come into play. If people want to learn and others want to teach or share their knowledge, we are more than happy to connect you through our communities. We see this as giving back to those we've worked with in the past, but also paying it forward to those we hope to work with in the future. To date, we have run hundreds of different events for engineers, developers, students, graduates, CTOs, the list goes on. We have run conferences, lightning talks, hackathons, all sorts. Earlier this year, we actually made our 5,000th introduction through our Meet to Mentor community. Um, we're really excited about that and looking forward to the next thousand introductions there. As I've already said, we love to give opportunities for people to connect and this event today is part of that. If you would like to know more about any of our other communities, again, please do get in touch with myself or Helen Lewis if you know her and we can take it from there. Just to let you know, today's session is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. I will put the link to the channel in the chat for you so you've got it later on. And if you have any questions while Rory's speaking, please do put them in the chat or if you're able to unmute and ask yourself, feel free to do that as well. It's a very informal event today, so you're welcome to do that. With no further ado, though, I'm going to hand over to you, Rory. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Abby. Um, hello, everyone, and um, so welcome along to this talk. Uh, I hope you're interested in hearing a bit about container hacking. Um, what I really wanted to do today um, was, I'm guessing everyone is, is kind of familiar with it and uses containers to some degree or another. Um, but what I'm taking today is to look a bit at the kind of the, the attacker's mindset and how attackers might look at containers. What I want to start off with is explaining a bit about the underlying parts of how containers work. Because I, my, I had a previous career as a pen tester, and typically the way you would work as a pen tester, as a red teamer, the best thing to do is understand how each technology worked, because that let you understand how you might be able to attack it or subvert it or work around something. And containers is no different. The more you understand about how they work, the easier it is to both attack them, but also to secure them, right? Because if you understand how to attack them, you can understand how to secure them. So anyway, let's get started. Um, yeah, so my background, uh, expat pen tester, IT security person, worked for various um, consultancies, financial services. These days, I am a senior security advocate for Datadog. This talk is not about Datadog, um, but we are a large um, uh, SaaS observability monitoring and security company. Um, if you want to know more about that, ping me and I can put, put you in the direction of the right person. Uh, in the community, I do various things. Uh, I'm a CIS benchmark author for Docker and Kubernetes, which are the two products which I'll be talking about primarily today. Um, CIS benchmarks, if you've not come across them, are vendor neutral hardening guides. So essentially they are ways to um, secure systems, to harden them from the baseline. Uh, and the idea being, you know, you can do this without it being tied to any specific vendor. Hopefully useful. I'm also a member of a thing called Kubernetes SIG Security. The Kubernetes project is an open source uh, affair run by the CNCF, uh, and it divides itself into various special interest groups or SIGs, and there's one on security. Uh, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, maybe this talk will spark an interest. We meet uh, uh, bi-weekly, uh, so it's very easy to just pop along and attend. So, as I said, what I want to start off with, a bit about how containers work. Um, containers are not new. That's the very first thing to get in, to kind of to come across is that containerization, whilst it's probably a, a factor of the last sort of five or six years, um, it's been around for a long time. 
So containers have been around since 1979 or something like containers when the Cheroot system call got added to Unix. I'm going back a long way there. But things like containers uh, have been around since around 2000 when FreeBSD jails, Linux vServer, Solar Zones all came up with this idea of running isolated applications on a single host, which is basically what containers are. Um, but then 2013, 10 years ago now, uh, was when Docker got started. And Docker was what really kind of kicked off a lot of the kind of industry enthusiasm uh, and kind of really saw a major growth kind of started around there or after there. Containers, uh, this is just one slide a little bit about containers being popular. This is from the Stack Overflows survey last year. They do a survey every year uh, and they talk about um, what technologies developers use. Um, one of the things they asked about was what technologies do te do people use who uh, which are programming languages or frameworks. And as you can see there, Docker was at number one and Kubernetes was at number five, which for relatively new projects, um, I suppose maybe not that new now, but still, you know, they kind of come a long way uh, since they got started. Um, the thing, however, of course, when things get more popular is they get more open to attack, right? The more people use it, the more attackers think, well, this is something I want to understand and try to attack. Um, an interesting thing about how uh, Kubernetes is usually run, so Kubernetes is, is, we'll talk more about exactly what it is later on, but it's the kind of the common container orchestrator, the, by far and away the most used one, is that um, by default, many of the large cloud providers, so Microsoft, Google, Amazon, all put Kubernetes clusters on the internet. So if you go to Amazon and you start an EKS cluster, it will directly connect that cluster to the internet by default. Uh, so you can look with uh, with search engines. This is a thing called Shodan, uh, which is like an internet search engine for services. And you can see um, there's 1.5, this, when I ran this one, there was 1.5 million. It varies between about 1 million and about 1.5 million hosts running Kubernetes connected directly to the internet. So we can kind of tell by that how popular this is because there's an awful lot of it in use. So um, there is a problem with all of this, and I'm sure everyone who's worked in IT is familiar with this problem, not just in containers, but in pretty much any type of, uh, of, um, of technology, is there's a problem of technology overload. You know, there are so many, this is just a, a word cloud I made, just some of the buzzwords or things you would need, you, 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 know, you will see if you read um, documents about this one's Kubernetes based. Uh, there's just lots and lots of words. So it becomes quite hard to understand what's going on, right? Because things get obscured by the terminology. It's hard to understand what's actually going on because you're just reading buzzwords. And um, that's kind of one of the reasons why I want to take the approach of like looking a bit under the covers and talking about what containers actually are, what, how containers actually work before we talk about attacking them, because really that's going to help hopefully in saying, okay, I understand how this works. I can understand um, how maybe to attack it. So let's demystify containers. Let's try and say, what actually is a container? Um, how do they work? And we'll look a little bit about, we'll do a couple of demonstrations um, and see, you know, see if we can see some sort of real world examples. So uh, first thing, um, what is a container? Uh, what is a Docker container? Uh, and this quote came from um, someone called Jesse Frizzell, who was one of the pioneers of Docker security uh, in 2017. Containers are not a real thing. So what do we mean by that? Well, um, if you go looking through the Linux kernel source code for virtual machines, you'll see references to virtual machines because Linux supports VM technology. If you do the same thing for containers and you look through the Linux kernel source code for containers or Docker, you won't find anything because containers aren't really a, a unified construct. People didn't have like this idea of making primitives to construct a container. What in fact happened was that people took existing Linux functionality, things that Linux already had and already has, and put it all together in a kind of user-friendly package. And that's fundamentally what containers are. Um, we can kind of try and illustrate that uh, with this diagram. So really, this is trying to show you um, what containers are or how containers are built um, from a security standpoint. What we've got here in the middle is we've got a process, so a program, an application, any application that runs on Linux or indeed on Windows can be containerized because literally all a container is, is a process. So if you think about containers, you're literally just thinking about a running program. It could be any program written in any language. As long as it runs on either Linux or Windows, it will work in a container. On top of that, we obviously want to try and isolate it. I mean, that's the promise of containers, right? We're going to isolate this process, this application from all the other applications running on that machine. 
And what Docker did when they first set this thing up was they looked at the things that already existed in Linux and said, how can we use these to isolate these processes, these programs, away from everything else? And they came up with essentially a set of existing facilities. There's a thing called namespaces in Linux, uh, and this essentially allows a, you to say, this program can only see certain limited resources. That could be network resources, it could be file system resources, it could be process IDs, but basically this namespaces allow you to limit the view of what's available. And then capabilities are used to try and lock down what happens if you run a containerish route. So if you've used containers a lot, you've used Docker, you'll have noticed that all of the containers you start by default run as root. Root user on Linux is usually all, all powerful. It can do anything it wants. That's not very isolated. So what we do is we say we're going to use capabilities. I'm going to remove a wide variety of capabilities. So even if you are the root user, you don't have all the rights of root. We then use C groups. Um, C groups are used in Linux generally to restrict resources. So memory, CPU, things like that. You don't want one application running on a host to chew all of the CPU on the host. How do you do that? You use C groups. You say, I'm going to limit how much CPU you can have. Then there's another couple of layers, um, AppArmor and SE Linux and Secomp, which are designed to actually lock down um, more, actually apply additional filters um, on top of the ones we've already got with these three. These apply additional filters on specific things. So Secomp limits system calls. Uh, it's quite fine going, quite low level. Usually when you're using containers, you won't spend too much time with these. Um, but ideally, when you're running them, you'd understand that this is all what's being used. And you can kind of modify how Docker runs because a lot of its defaults aren't necessarily super hardened and highly secure. Anyway, that's the theory part anyway. So let's actually demonstrate that, right? Because that was all theory, lovely lots of theory. Let's try and look at an actual practical demonstration. So here we are on a Linux host, uh, and this Linux host um, is um, running Docker. So what we're going to do is um, I'm first going to run the command ps fc nginx. This just lets me look for any Nginx web servers currently running on this machine. And we get back none, right? This is a Linux host. It's not currently running any instances of the Nginx web server. I'm now going to do docker run uh, minus, uh, minus minus name. Oops, minus minus name. Web server. So I'm going to run a new container on this machine. I'm going to use uh, run the, the Nginx image. I'm, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it web server. That essentially um, now runs a new Docker container, right? If I do Docker PS, I can see my new web server container there. Remember though, the point of what I said in the last slide was that containers are just processes, right? That, that's literally all they are. So as far as this machine is concerned, it's now running an Nginx process. And we can see, we can show that by looking again. So I'm running the PS command process list, looking for Nginx processes on the VM. And now we can see that we've got a set of Nginx processes. We've got five of them because that's how Nginx works. Bonds four workers from a master. So as far as this host is concerned, it doesn't know containers, it doesn't know anything what a container is. All it knows is it's now got an instance of Nginx working. This is kind of interesting though from a security standpoint because it means anyone on the host can see all of the processes running inside containers on that machine. And we can also interact with them, which I can kind of demonstrate. What I'll do is I'm going to um, I'm going to create a new file inside my web server container. So I've got my web server container, a web server, and I just use Docker exec to create a new file inside it. So we'll just use the touch command. I'll create, oops, I would call it my. Not exactly what I meant to do, but we can go with that. We've got a new file now called my inside our container. Um, and if I get the process ID of my Nginx web server, what I can do is I do sudo ls proc that root. And what that does is this is a special Linux file system called proc, which has information about every running process on the machine. And I can actually see inside my container just by using that standard Linux command ls. And you can see here, there is the file called my. So I've created my new file uh, using Docker exec, but it's completely visible and accessible using standard Linux commands because containers are just Linux processes. Um, 
And that kind of demonstrates the fact you can actually interact with containers quite a lot just using standard Linux tooling. You don't have to use Docker or Kubernetes or anything else. So that's what a Docker container is, right? It's just a process. And we don't need the video because the demo worked okay. Oh, no, I don't want the video. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we talked about containers there. I kind of quite briefly, by the way, if anyone has any questions as we go, please do feel free to put them in the chat. There's quite a few concepts here. I'm happy to kind of delve more into them if that's going to be useful. So I talked a bit about what a container is there. Containers are just processes. Good to know. But what I did there was I pulled down um, the Nginx container image. So obviously I had to go and get something called Nginx, which came from Docker Hub. Uh, and I um, and that was the thing that actually had all the files and everything else that I ran inside my container. So what actually are container images? So that's a container image. That one was called Nginx. If you look at Docker Hub, this is actually a slightly old screenshot. I think there's somewhere above 8 million different container images on Docker Hub. Um, and all of them uh, work in pretty much the same way. But all they actually are is tarballs. So if you've ever used the Linux command tar to create a tar file, that is what container images are. They are literally just tarballs with some JSON metadata. And you can interact with containers by, again, anything which knows how to work with tarballs, you can work with container images as well. And we can kind of demonstrate that one too. So um, if I create a new directory on this machine and then go into it, I don't want to make a mess of my root file system. Uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to do Docker save nginx. Uh, and we're going to just create uh, a tar file from our container image. So what I'm doing there, I'm just using a command called docker save, and that allows you to turn any image in Docker into a tar file. And when it has finished, which it has now, we should now be able to look at that tar file. So if I look at it at the file system level, I've now got a tar file. And if I actually extract that tar file, I'm going to, I'm going to copy paste this command because otherwise I'm going to make typos. Uh, I can just extract that. and one, two, there. We can see, let me put it up at the top of the screen so it's more easily visible. This is literally what a container image is. So anytime you've used a Docker file to create a container image, or maybe you've used some other technology, there's a variety of out there to use container images. Fundamentally, what you're doing is creating a, a set of tarballs. So they're kind of like nested tarballs. If I do three, we can see each layer of our Docker image is just a tar file. And then each layer has a little bit of JSON metadata, which describes the layer in question. So basically, it's just tar and JSON. That's it. You can actually manually build container images using the file system. There's some checksums and things to get right. But fundamentally, if you want to, you can create container images without you can completely manually. And we can actually kind of demonstrate uh, that a little bit as well by doing another command called docker export. Um, and this just gives us a slightly different view, a slightly easier to look at view of, um, of what's in a container, because that was all you know hashed uh, um, file system names and things. If I uh, do that, and then go into Nginx export, you can actually see this is the container we were running earlier. So this is my Nginx container, the one we created the file in. There it is there, a little file that I called my. It was going to be called my new file by hit enter unexpectedly. Um, so anyway, the, the, you can actually get essentially the entire file system out of a container image just by getting a tarball and extracting it. And that is essentially what is the Nginx image. You can do that with any um, container image. So if you ever want to go and look at container images, you can just turn them into tarballs and then manipulate them and look at them in the same way as they were a tar file. So that's basically all it is. And kind of the idea of what I'm going through here is all of what, or almost all of what containers do is just Linux. If you know Linux and you know how Linux works, you pretty much know exactly what containers are doing. Okay. Right. There we go. So what is Docker? So we've described um, what is a container. We've said that containers are processes. That's all they are. And we've said that um, Docker images, container images, are just tarballs. 
So what does Docker actually do for us here? What is Docker actually um, essentially providing on top of these things? And primarily the answer to that is actually user friendliness in that you don't have to know about any of those things like namespaces or capabilities to run a Docker container. And um, you don't have to know how to go and get that image from the container registry. At a technology level, Docker is a Golang binary. So it's a statically compiled Golang binary, which talks over HTTP uh, using a Unix socket. Uh, Unix sockets are essentially just a way to talk to servers that run locally. So you don't actually have to expose a network port. So it talks over a, um, a Unix socket by default to a Docker daemon, which is just a web server, essentially. It, it, it speaks REST, it's like a REST API. The Docker daemon will talk as needed to a container registry, which is another REST API. So again, you're used to dealing with REST APIs, with HTTP, all of containerization is fundamentally built on REST APIs. And then the Docker daemon will create these containers, which are just processes. So essentially it's a client plus a daemon, which talks to and creates containers and the containers are just processes. And it's all fundamentally, all the comms is HTTP. So again, if you're using containers or you're hacking containers, so from a pen tester standpoint, when I look at this, I go, well, now all of the techniques I know to attack web services, I can use or try to use on containers because they are just web services. So, and we can kind of demonstrate that as well. So for this demo, what we're going to do is, for this demo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually intercept the traffic. So we had those two uh, different components, we've got Docker Client and Docker Daemon. I'm actually going to intercept the traffic and look at the traffic going between those two. So we can actually see, you know, the point I just made around the fact it's just web services stuff. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm using a command called SoCat. Uh, SoCat essentially is just a program that lets you man in the middle, uh, um, stand as a man in the middle between a client and a service. Uh, and uh, I'm essentially going to do that with Docker. So I run this in one window and let's just let that sit for a little second. And then uh, in the other window, I'm just gonna run a Docker command. So I'm just gonna say, give me a list of images uh, in, in the Docker system on this machine. And when I do that on this machine, it just does exactly what if you've ever done that on Docker, it just shows you a list of images. But over here, in my SoCat window, the thing where I was using this man in the middle attack, essentially, to look what's going on, you can actually see what it did. Uh, and you can see it, it issued an HTTP head command, and this is just it checking to make sure the server's running. And then it said, um, where's the next one? Here, get slash 142, which is the version of the Docker API, slash images, slash JSON. So it literally is just a REST API. And then it came back and it said, okay, here is a list, a JSON format, everything's JSON. Uh, of all the images. So that's literally all Docker does. Essentially, it sits there and you it, you don't need to know the exact format of the commands, but if you wanted to, you could totally hit it with any HTTP client, curl, anything else, and it'll work just fine. So. Okay, so that was a reasonably fast uh, introduction to what uh, these things, how these things work, what's the, the details of how they work. But let's talk about security. Um, Docker has what I will call a flexible security model. Basically, Docker provides all this isolation, but it assumes that anyone who can run Docker commands is trusted to remove it all. So it isolates the process from the underlying host. It isolates the process from, underlying, from other processes running on the machine. But it also says that if you're able to run Docker commands, then obviously you're trusted and you can do whatever you want. As a result, if you're ever on a machine with Docker, as a hacker, as an attacker, you can pretty much always be root whenever you want to be. You just have to run one command. Uh, the command in question is this. This is uh, a blog post by a guy called Ian Meal uh, from, I think, 2015, where he called this the most pointless Docker command ever. In my previous life as a pen tester, this was actually my favorite Docker command because I used it a fair amount when I was doing security tests on people's container systems. Um, and I'll, I'll demonstrate it and I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing uh, uh, as I demonstrate it. So I'm going to copy paste this one as well because I will definitely mistype it if I try. And uh, do it manual. So what this command does, it's another standard Docker command um, and it has a load of switches on it. There's this switch here. Um, which is minus minus privileged. Uh, and I actually was talking to the guy who put this switch into Docker uh, last week. 
And he said they, they want, he wanted to call it minus minus insecure because that's basically what it is. That switch, it means turn off all the security. Um, and then these switches here basically say, give me access to the host's resources. So instead of using namespaces to isolate me away, give me everything the host has got. And then this switch here says, give me the host's root file system inside my container. Um, so before I hit enter, I'll mention that I am the Rory M, so I'm an ordinary user here. I don't have any rights apart from the fact I can run Docker commands. And when I hit enter on this command, I am now the root user. So that's, it's as simple as that. That's not really a very elite hacking technique, although it is quite useful. But basically, anywhere you ever get to run Docker containers, you can run something that looks a bit like that, and you get to be root on the host. Very nice if you're an attacker. Not so great if you're trying to administer that system. And let's... Okay, so that was a fairly whistle-stop tour of Docker uh, and how it works. But I'm guessing that most of you, if you're running a lot of containers in production these days, won't be using Docker directly. You're far more likely to be using Kubernetes. Um, for anyone who hasn't come across Kubernetes, uh, the very quick version of this is that Kubernetes essentially orchestrates lots and lots of containers. So essentially it allows you to have fleets of tens or hundreds or thousands of machines, virtual machines or physical servers running some form of container software could be Docker, could be Cryo, could be Container D, and you don't need to know exactly how the containers are deployed to those nodes. You just basically say, I want five new web servers or 20 new database servers or whatever else. And Kubernetes' job is to handle making that happen and to manage all the resources across all the different nodes. There's lots and lots of different types of Kubernetes. There's over a hundred different Kubernetes flavors or distributions. Um, but, but they all pretty much look a bit like this. There are a set of control plane nodes uh, up the top here. Uh, and these control plane nodes run uh, the API server, which is another REST API. So again, from both a security and usability standpoint, if you know REST APIs, Kubernetes is a REST API. A couple of the components, which are used mainly internally, you won't talk to those directly. And then there is a database because you need somewhere to store all the data information, the state of the cluster. That's typically a key value store called etcd. You can swap that out, but the vast majority of installs I've ever seen use etcd. And then it has a set of worker nodes. The worker nodes are where the, the containers actually run. So you say, I want you know, five new web servers. They get distributed amongst the worker nodes. The API server talks to a thing called the kubelet. The kubelet essentially is like the node agent. Uh, it runs on every worker node. And then we have a container engine which is Docker or Kubernetes or Cryo or ContainerD, something which runs containers. So a basic level, you, you talk to the API server, you say, I want whatever. It then says to one or more kubelets, hey, can you go and create some containers? And the containers are then spun up and they're just processes. One of Kubernetes main selling points though, is that say I am running 50 different applications across say a hundred different nodes. The developers, the people who are writing those applications, don't want to have to know about the details of the network they're deploying to. They want it to be able to talk between the different you know, microservices or however else you're deploying your apps. And what Kubernetes does is it provides a container network. By default, every single service in a cluster can talk to every other service in a cluster over a flat network. You basically just say, I want to talk to the name of the service and it will always work. And that's one of the main benefits of how Kubernetes handles it. You don't need to know the details of the fact that it's you know exactly what network plugins it's running or what cloud provider it's on or anything like that. You just tell it, let me talk to this other service. Um, but that's kind of relevant. I talk a little bit about how people tend to get hacked. So from a security standpoint, um, if you remember, I said that Docker is essentially um, command execution as a service. Right? So Docker uh, essentially lets you run commands. And if you want to be root, you can be root. Kubernetes orchestrates Docker. Um, so all it is is a set of lots and lots of Docker systems and something which orchestrates them. So the same security challenge applies. If I let someone create containers inside a Kubernetes cluster, by default, they can be the root user on every single node in that cluster. This is true of almost every flavor of Kubernetes out of the box. OpenShift, I think probably not, which is Red Hat's Kubernetes. But in, by and large, any Kubernetes cluster, this, this next demonstration will work on just fine if you don't change the base configuration. So we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate that. 
Uh, so where are we? What I'm going to do, uh, I need to be in the right here. We're just going to create a, a workload on a very um, on a very kind of simple basic poster. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll create it first and then I'll show you how it works once I've set it up to go. So that's just the Kubernetes command for um, create a new workload from a file. The files in Kubernetes are all YAML, which is I think stand for yet another markup language. Um, and um, the main thing to know about that is it's white space significant, which is kind of annoying sometimes. But let me just show you what what this how this this workload works for while it's running. So what I've done here is I've created this a workload based on this definition. This definition essentially has a lot of the same flags you'll remember from my most pointless Docker command. Because Kubernetes basically runs on top of Docker, a lot of the flags are the same. They just kind of translated into how you write them in the YAML. So here I'm saying, give me access to the host three services. This is the node on the cluster that this is getting run on. It could be any node in the cluster. And then it also has this concept of privileged, the turn off all the security flag. So you're, if you can create pods in a, in a Kubernetes cluster, you can turn off all the security. And you can also mount in volumes from the underlying machine. So you can do all the different things you did in Docker, but you can do them in Kubernetes. So what I should be able to do now is, uh, is actually execute a command inside that Kubernetes pod that I created. And as you'll see before I run this command, I'm currently the root Rory M user, so an ordinary user, on this host called Killian. When I hit enter on this command, I am now the root user on the cluster node that I ran it on. In this case, there's only one node in this cluster, but I'm now the root user in that node. So I'm, I'm literally root. I could do anything you like. I could delete all the files. I could go and you know get access to any sensitive data that's running on that machine. So by default, as a, a hacker, definitely in the early days of my pen testing career in Kubernetes, a lot of the cases where someone said, um, if you, you got access to create pods, can you get root on the nodes, was that simple. I was done in about five to 10 minutes, which made things nice and easy. But it is definitely one thing to know about um, as a security person or as someone who's using Kubernetes is by default, anyone can do that. And they get to be root on whichever node of the cluster they want to be. And when you think about what we've talked about so far, it kind of makes sense, right? Docker is just creating, it's just remote command execution. And um, Kubernetes just distributes that amongst lots and lots of machines. So it's literally giving people the rights to do that. This. There we go. Um, actually, one thing I should probably mention, I, I always forget this when I do this talk, um, but I should mention it. Um, some of the stuff I'm talking about here, uh, definitely things like that node root, node root pod that I just ran, and some of the exploits I'm going to talk about in a second. Very, very, very importantly, never ever run these on a cluster that you are not fully authorized to run it against. Don't try this on a cluster because you think it might be interesting. Only make sure you're running this because people can, security people might misinterpret what you're doing and they might think you're trying to hack into their cluster. Um, it's very important when you're doing any kind of security, offensive security work to make sure you are definitely authorized um, to do that work on whatever system you're targeting. But just one to think about. So in terms of, of internet exposed um, Kubernetes services, I mentioned at the top of the talk, there's about 1.5 million of these, um, depending on exactly what search engine you use and, and what, what month it is. Of those, there's about a million, um, which are the API server. So that central component. So like I said, all the cloud providers put on the internet by default. Um, of those, about 800,000 will return a valid version number. So they'll tell you what exact version of Kubernetes they're running. That's exposed by default without authentication in most cases. Um, running a visibly unsupported version number is about 155,000. Again, that number changes depending on exactly um, how long it's been. Um, but it's hundreds of thousands. So there's hundreds of thousands of clusters running unsupported versions of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has a relatively short support lifecycle, um, between 12 and 18 months, depending on the distribution. So um, there's quite a lot of people already kind of running out of support on their Kubernetes clusters, uh, which again, if you're an attacker, that's good. If you're a defender, that's not so great. There's also quite a lot of these Kubelet node engines um, and etcd databases as well, visible on the internet. Uh, so it's something which, from attackers' perspective, they've definitely noticed. We've seen quite a few campaigns where um, attackers will target Kubernetes because they can use it to run, honestly, 
A lot of what they do is use it from cryptocurrency mining because that's a good way to make money from your attack. But there could also be things like ransomware and any other kind of attack. But obviously with that kind of attack surface, people are going to make mistakes with the configuration and you're going to get people getting compromised.